Hello and welcome to this episode of On The Sport, where each week we choose and debate one of the big questions facing our society. I am your host, Shivana Tanya Mainka. If you were watching this 20 years ago, you'd probably be viewing this show in its regular slots after the evening news, but chances are you're on YouTube right now. There's a global shift from traditional TV to the internet. The evolution of technology is changing in how we produce media and how we consume it. The days when 4 million people sat down at 4 p.m. to watch Oprah are long gone, which brings us to tonight's topic. What is the future of television? Before we start, I'd like to welcome our audience as well as the four panelists we have here. To my left, we have Professor Harry Dagmore, the coordinator of the Honours Programs at the Rhodes School of Journalism and Media Studies. Next to him, we have Anima McBrown, who is, an, who is the LOTV presenter of the Roundtable as well as a JMS4 student at the Rhodes University School of Journalism. To my right, we have Professor Priscilla Borshen, who is a lecturer at the Rhodes University School of Journalism. Next to her, we have Sharissa Cassell, who is a politics major and journalism major. Welcome. <laughs> Today we're taking changes in technology and viewership trends. Evolving styles of news pieces and shifts in the representation of minority groups in TV. First up, the traditional style of delivering news is changing. The new style and tone of on-demand short news that we see online are very different to the traditional formal news bulletins. Let's take a look at these different styles. Hello and welcome to Cheesy Traditional News. I'm Zamele Tuli. We have some breaking news. Television is changing. So, we all know that traditional TV used to be at a set time by a set network. But in the past few years, live television viewership has fallen from 52% to 40%. Every age group is consistently spending less time watching television, except for people in the age bracket above 65 years. The question is, where are young viewers going? Our reporter, Lucy Grinka, has gone undercover amongst millennials to find us out. Thanks, Summer. As you can see, I'm here in the natural habitat of the millennial. And what we've learned is that younger viewers are moving to digital media. The use of smartphones and tablets are rapidly increasing, and half of all that mobile traffic is spent watching video. These trends are very clear in countries like the United States. The question is, Will South Africa inevitably follow the same path? Sombaloni, Dumilong, Abushini, um... Hi. Today we're going to be playing the Touch My Body Challenge where we touch each other's bodies while wearing a blindfold. I hope you guys enjoyed the story time. Please give this video a very big thumbs up. Well, let us consider what we have just watched here. I'll start with you, Sharissa. Why do you think younger people are moving away from watching traditional news bulletins? Is this because of a shortfall in traditional news? I wouldn't say so. I would think it's more about accessibility. So where we find our news largely is on our cell phones. So that's something that you can find anywhere because your cell phone is always on you. But if you're looking at TVs, you have to physically be in a space where television is, and then that's the only way you can access news. I also think um, in terms of traditional news, we, we like things that are more visual, right? So on your phone, it's a video, as was played in the clip, you see videos, and that's more interesting than having to read an actual article. So I think it's appealing to the digital age that we are in, and as well, um, the, the people that we're trying to get this information across to. For me, I think I would say, I would add that it's also about what we're seeing. Um, attention spans, um, mm -hmm. impatience or patience. We want sort of like something interesting, appealing, but in quick snippets. So we get bit bored very easily and we are most likely to sort of have, allow ourselves to be distracted if what we're seeing is not getting to the point or appealing to what um, we're looking for, something that's gonna pique our interest for longer. Mm -hmm. So the content as well uh, matters. Content. 
Harry, do you think there is value in the traditional TV news style that we lose in digital formats? What do we lose if content is produced by a huge organization like the BBC or, I mean, versus, you know, your average Joe? The difficulty with your average Joe Jane is that they don't often get the access that the big organizations do. So having a large institutional news organization behind you, when you pick up the phone and you phone the mayor and you say, I want to know why there's no water in extension 9, mm. the mayor is going to take your call. Whereas with ordinary uh, participatory journalists, that's not going to happen. So that's the one thing. The second thing is that if the mayor doesn't like what you say and wants to sue you for a million rands, pounds, dollars, uh, then it's also very helpful to have that institutional heft behind you. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. about collecting the news, getting the access, developing sources, yeah. uh, and, and then also having that, that legal uh, backing to get your stories out. Okay. What does this mean for journalism and you know, job security for journalists? I'll open this up to the panelists. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Mm. I, I think all journalists these days are worried about their jobs, are worried about mm. the viability of journalism, worried about fake news yeah. mm. and the impact that digital technologies have on the news collection and distribution process and the implications for journalistic identity. Mm. So it, it, it does raise a lot of questions which were debated recently at the um, Highway Africa conference. Harry, were you there at some of those debates? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it is. We are moving into a, a gig economy. Mm -hmm. uh, we're moving into the Uberization of everything. Mm -hmm. and, and really, people wanting to keep things flexible. But yeah. The, yeah. what goes is job security, yeah. medical aids, retirement yeah. schemes. Mm -hmm. And journalism is getting rapidly changed in that regard. Yeah. It's becoming increasingly a series of freelance stringing gig economies. and. I think we have to worry about that because, again, of that lack, mm. possible lack of institutional heft, having, yeah. having mm. something of substance yeah. behind you. Yeah. What does that then say to the competition within the media industry and, you know, with the young people trying to get jobs? Does it, you know... I, I think what it speaks to is sort of having journalists or people, students that are studying journalists, to find different perspectives of approaching news. Because what we're seeing is people are saying, everybody can be a journalist. Why, if you have a Facebook account, you can write mm. an article. A lot of people can do freelance writing mm. who aren't necessarily majoring in journalism. Absolutely. So I think we, we see now there's like a lot of people that are creating YouTube um, channels of their own. Mm. We have Sibum Banza, who's a YouTube hit. And mm. I think with, with people like that, he's found something that other people have already done, but a different angle of doing it. Mm. And I think that's the challenge that is now sort of proposed to students who are studying journalism. What angle are you now going to use to um, portray different ideas within the media? Because you also have the power now to create that narrative, right? Because that's what we, we taught. We taught that you can sort of create different narratives. So what narrative are you creating that is different from other people as well? Sure, so, so you're speaking innovation in the field, right? Yes, definitely. I'll open this to the audience. I mean, what she said is making me think of how, as myself, I am a journalism student. Mm -hmm. I'm now thinking about, okay, when I move out of this environment, how do I shape myself as mm -hmm. a brand? Because a lot of what I consume um, digitally is, is a lot of brands and a lot of people are turning themselves into brands and it seems that's what, um, that's what these companies want and that's what is more attractive. So how do mm -hmm. I, how do I brand myself so that I am marketable as a mm -hmm. journalist, which is mm -hmm. crazy. Um, so that I can secure some kind of employment and I can remain relevant. On that note, the move from long-form journalism to short-form digital platform video content has seen questions arise about whether this format is more appealing to millennials. What does this mean for us South Africans and how will this trend in the U.S. affect us? Our on-the-spot researcher takes a look. 27 June 2017, MTV announces that it plans to expand on its digital platform as a way to appeal to a younger audience. In the process, long-form journalism is abandoned for this digital platform. MTV News is not the only media institution headed towards this direction and follows on footsteps of institutions such as Huffington Post, Mashable and Vocative. Teenagers are not impressed with this move, some arguing that this is dumbing down what a young audience finds appealing. Now back in South Africa, 
The introduction of Huffington Post essay in 2016 sees them try to tap into this kind of style. Other institutions that try to head into this direction is the Daily Vox, examples being their South Africa apartheid and Israel apartheid videos. Something interesting is that all these institutions target audience as young people. So looking at this and understanding the impact of US media in a global context, where we see South Africa taking on more digital news and letting go of long-form journalism as a way to appeal to a younger audience. Can this also work, considering the issues of access in South Africa? Interesting changes we've seen in this clip. Now, I think we tend to just assume that our media will follow the trends of the United States. Um, do you think we overestimate how much the South African media is changing? Um, Priscilla, do you have anything to say? Overestimate? Mm. I mean, it's true that South African media landscape is changing so rapidly, we can't really keep track. Mm. Whether it's necessarily going to follow an American model, mm, I think South Africa and Africa more broadly is interesting because of the way media is indigenized in, in our context and we do interesting things with digital platforms in the way that we've done with other media platforms yeah. so I don't know if we, we should necessarily say that we're just going to become another America in that sense but but as, so, as far as shorter more more visual intensive less reading hmm, Personally, I worry about that. Yeah. Um, but but the platforms do support. It's the nature of the platform, the digital platform, um, and the, the the trends certainly are more towards a visual culture. So we can't ignore that. Mm. Certainly. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. All right. Um, Charissa, do you have anything to add on to that? I think also something that's still important is accessibility. Mm, you need absolutely. to understand that not everybody in mm. Africa within South Africa has access to cell phones mm. and can access the media digitally. Mm. So if we're looking at how newspapers are like sort of being sort of phased out, I think that's also problematic for people who don't have access mm. to smartphones, right. right? So we need to try and find mm. something that is inclusive because if we're going to compare ourselves to America, they have different social issues than what we have. So we can't want to transform in one way mm -hmm. without looking at other social factors mm -hmm. such as class and accessibility, right? Yeah. So I think we, it's, it's not a one-track issue. There, there are many facets. It's multifaceted, rather, mm -hmm. right? So if we're going to transform, then we need to be able to transform all the different spheres mm -hmm. that affect access to media. Absolutely. You've brought up a very important point, which brings us to our next question. The Internet is largely inaccessible to many South Africans. Um, Anima, do you think we run the risk of having a divided media, one that takes place online and on a more traditional media platform, like uh, television? Definitely possible, um, but it's also about the cost of things because, I mean, money makes the world go round, I think, still. Um, <laughs> so if, if we can get things to be more affordable, then obviously that speaks to access. Um, if you can localize things and contextualize them, mm -hmm. um, if by that I mean still follow trends and be part of a global media world, but do things in a South African way, mm -hmm. um, that starts to speak to um, what we and our people need and what is we're going to be able to respond to. And it, I think it's also going to help us plan long-term solutions of how to transform media in this landscape. It's about what works, but what can work over a long period of time, so longevity mm -hmm. and relevance. Right, so are you saying it's not exactly a divide? There's a divide, but mm. there, there's so much that can be done creatively mm. with financial backing, with the right investors, and the, the right people making decisions that can counter that, or at least start to close that gap. I think there certainly is a divide in terms of class access to different forms of media. It's not just whether or not you have a cell phone, it's whether you can afford the data. Mm. But there are other kinds of in inaccessibility. It's not everyone who can afford to like go to a classical concert, for example, or who can fly, afford to fly to Cape Town to the latest international gig. So there are many, it's not just digital. I think there are many forms of media that have different forms of access for, for different people. Also, I'd like to go back to the idea that we're moving away from traditional media and 
everyone is just simply migrating mm -hmm. helter skelter to to digital. I think these these things are used together in a far more nuanced way than just simply being one or the other. Mm. We sit in front of the television with our with our, our with our cell phones. Mm. Um, we're we're texting while we change channel. Mm. Um, so I think we I think for, for me I like to think of the complexities of of our media landscape rather mm. than thinking of it in terms of binaries. Mm. Keeping in mind though that there are quite quite significant um, forms of access depending on geography, on class, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Did you have a point as well? Um, Priscilla touched on a lot of like my points. Yeah. Um, in terms of like data access, Wi-Fi, we also need to look at the prices mm -hmm. and the debates that are mm -hmm. going on there. Not everybody mm -hmm. can afford to buy data for a certain amount. We also know mm -hmm. how quickly data runs out if you accessing, mm -hmm. for example, YouTube. Mm -hmm. So those are mm -hmm. things to take into mm -hmm. consideration. And the divide when it comes to traditional media and digital, we need to take in consideration the older generation, because like, I haven't been hearing much mention about that. The older generation is not just going to jump ship to digital. You know, mm -hmm. perhaps some of them might not feel comfortable reading a newspaper article on a tablet versus holding a newspaper physically, engaging with it mm -hmm. physically. You know, um, my parents aren't likely to go on to YouTube and say, I'm going to watch Sibon Panza because mm -hmm. this is what mm -hmm. I find interesting. So mm -hmm. it's also about interest mm -hmm. and the topics that are being discussed. I think, I think the point of topics is really important. I mean, you haven't, I mean, with the, the emergence of television didn't lead to a decline in radio, mm. or it didn't lead to the erasure, uh, erasure of radio. Yeah. Um, radio didn't lead <coughs> to newspapers going extinct. Mm. Um, mm. Certain things are appropriate for certain genres, right? Mm. I'm not going to get my mm. business news um, in, at least I'm not going to get detailed business news from television, uh, but I am from a, a newspaper that's dedicated yeah. to that. Mm. Um, I'm not going to get celeb gossip from a business newspaper. Yeah. Uh, mm. What I'm interested in and a topic I'm uh, focusing on mm. um, in some way determines which media mm. platform I'm going to use. And while all those topics are going to be important, you're always going to get a diversity of media. Um, while I agree with him, I think also all those media platforms are existing on the digital platform as well. You mm -hmm. have radio, is on, it's online as well. You have podcasts, you have, if you are interested in like a business um, newspaper like you can access that online as well but um, I think also the the part where um, a large number of our country does not necessarily access that they cannot afford that means that they will still resort to listening to radio and um, buying newspapers but also um, from where I come from in Pretoria the townships they are changing um, and I don't know if it's happening all across the country but almost each and every township right now the neighboring sc the schools in the townships they've introduced a system of free Wi-Fi and even if like if your house is literally next to the school you have free Wi-Fi mm -hmm. and um, therefore that tells you that our communities will move into a digital era because even the areas that are supposed to be poor are now accessing um, free Wi-Fi um, so Maybe the ch maybe the shift won't happen as fast as we are a developing country, but it is happening. It is in progress. Mm -hmm. We'll move on to our next topic. What comes to your mind when you think of a black woman on television? Our crew put together a piece on representation of black women on TV. If we're not ghetto or ratchet, then like we're being loud and we're unmanned. <laughs> I don't know where advertisers get this thing of whenever we see washing powder, we just start dancing. And we're so happy to be cleaning, you know, manual labor, it's what we were born for. And it's only ever like full figured women who are in these long dresses, or we're domestic workers, or we're strippers and hookers. It's never just something positive showing us in a positive light, saying, okay, we're educated we're smart, we're in touch with our culture, and that doesn't make us uncivilized, it just makes us us, you know. Um, yeah, it's a very one-sided view of black women, and it's very, it's not us telling our stories, so it's twisted anyways. As we have 
scene, black women have been subjected to various stereotypes in the media now. Anima, do you think digital technology is giving black women a platform to tell their stories? I think it depends who is doing the storytelling. Mm. Um, if I can consume and produce at the same time, I'm going to represent myself in a way that speaks to who I am or closer to the truth or what that is. Um, if I give that power all to Harry, that might be different. So my question is, are we starting to see shifts in who gets to tell the stories or who gets to represent? Because that's going to determine what we actually see. Right. So representation is key in the entire um, movement towards having black women on media platforms. I think, as mentioned in the clip, there are different types of black women that are already represented. Mm -hmm. And it's either you have to be loud or you have to be ghetto, or you have to be too traditional. And although those are different types of black women represented, there's a certain narrative of black women that are not represented. And uh, that is your, your black academic, that is your black working mom who can do everything, right? Who can be a good wife, who can be a good mother, but also it can be a black woman who is single and is enjoying that and is not sort of um, forced to, you know, to conform to what society deems black women should be. And I think, as Anima said, it's not just necessarily about um, who's rep representing um, black women, but also how black women are also forced to represent themselves in a certain way in order to become a certain brand, right? So if you do have a radio talk show, you need to be loud and bubbly and you need to be outgoing. Or if you have a radio talk show where it's just white females and they'll have one black person, we call them the token black person, but that token black person needs to be the loudest in the room. And I think that's also, it sets a certain narrative that, and I think one talk show is The Talk. I'm not sure if that's, yeah, The, the Talk. And The Real as well, where the black women are there. And you can clearly see that they aren't there just because of their in intellect. But it's also, you need to be here to be loud, to make jokes, to be the feisty one. Yeah. And those are certain characteristics that have already been imposed on them. And I think it's also, as Anima said, who, who is doing the representation of black women. Right. With the digital platform and the media consumption that's happening online, do you think there's a change in representation that's happening already? I think based on having this conversation, there's already a change and shift of we identify that there are problems that are occurring, but also that we, we have the, the potential and we have the means to sort of change that narrative as well. So if we have aspiring journalism students or anyone who wants to create their own talk show and they want to create a different dynamic as to how black women are viewed, we have those means, or at least we have access to those means as well. Not everyone, but there is a bit more access to black women to create different narratives about themselves. So I do think like digital media and just the digital age allows you to create your own narrative yeah. and not to be forced to see one narrative Absolutely. from one person's perspective. Right. For me, the digital era has saved me as a black woman, ironically. I, having access to, because I feel like it's different in the sense where watching TV and radio, someone else is in control of what it is that I'm gonna see. And someone else for a long time has been controlling how black women are perceived and it's always been negative. But for the first time, I'm able to go on my cell phone, on my computer, and actively choose what I want to see mm. about myself. Because it's, it's not like TV where there's a script. I can go to a specific blog, to a specific music artist, to a specific, uh, whatever it is, I can go. And um, there are a lot of other black women who have the same access, who are putting out content that is empowering. Mm. And I've been empowered yeah. because of having that access. I've been able to see images of black women that look like myself yeah. and are doing things that I want to do, mm. you know, and it, it's, it's been different. Okay. Well, Harry, do you think, like Mananya said, having more voices out there and content creators means it's much harder for diverse voices to be had? Um, let's come out of just like black women, you know, diversity in general. I actually think it's a lot easier rather than a lot harder. I mean, what we're still facing a lot is the mainstream. The mainstream media still has a very substantial lack of diversity. One's not seen uh, the kind of diversity that you should. And that, that goes, you know, beyond the kind of normal stereotypes. It's it's all very well to have a sign language person in some of the news bulletins, etc. Mm -hmm. But 
one's got to think a lot about disability, one's got to think about gender, one's got to think about sexual orientation, etc. But the great thing, as was just said now, is that people have got the ability now to, to go very, very niche. So you've got thousands of websites that ordinary people can do. These There's a thousand digital flowers which mm. are blooming and mm. people can put up that content. And it is allowing people that are marginalized mm. by the mainstream to find a niche and to create the niche. Yes, it's hard to get hard to get heard mm. once you've got that niche, but at least you can create the channels, YouTube channel, there's a YouTube channel for everyone now. And it's a question of getting that out there and uh, popularizing it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I think I agree with what everybody's saying, but I think we continuously forgetting people who do not have that access. Sure. If they are consuming the regular SBC1 to ETV, mm. what are they seeing are on they? TV? Yeah. And I think yeah. that's where my biggest problem is right now, yeah. that you go to SBC1, it's still those same representations yeah. Yeah. that are really problematic. Yeah. And I think my issue is, how do we call those institutions in order and mm. tell them that we want more diversity? Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd also like just to comment on this discussion, which I find very fascinating. Yes, I'm fascinated by your story of, of finding digital media um, a space in which to find representations that you that you identify with, and I think that's the the strength of this the, of the diversity that digital media enable for all of us. But at the same time, as someone who thinks about gender, I. I worry that a valorization of digital platforms is necessarily going to do anything to change um, the position of women in South Africa at a, at a, on a broad level. Yeah. We, we are not seeing a decrease in gender-based violence. Mm. And we've had digital media now for 20 years. Sure. It's not actually helping the, you know, the substantive issues in our society. So I think we must be aware of mm. over-valorizing um, mm. We must be cautious of valorizing digital media um, as a solution to more mainstream hegemony of, of, of representation. I just think well, in addition to that, that when we watch, if you're talking about people that have access to just mainstream media, and if I'm thinking about television and people that can only watch SABC 1, 2, 3 and ETV, um, for instance, I watch Izzy Dingo. And the show doesn't stop and people start acting, but from the actual introductory song. And it's amazing that the visuals that you see is women being sexualized. Its mm -hmm. emphasis is placed on women's legs and they have to wear high that's heels right. and on their bodies. Mm -hmm. And that's not what mm -hmm. Isidengo is about. Mm -hmm. But that is something that draws people so in, up. right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's, the, it's the sexualization of the female body yeah. Yeah. to attract views. And mm -hmm. I think if we're going to change things, Maybe we should start with things like that. What type yeah. of message are we sending yeah. Yeah. with yeah. that introductory song and those visuals when we want people to watch a show like Isi Dengo, for instance? Which brings us to our next point. Feminism may have come a long way, but some would argue that sexist ideals are still shown on television. Can you imagine television that doesn't reinforce traditional gender norms? We look at how that might be possible in the future of television. Taking the above clip into consideration and the kind of gender representation that we see in media and specifically on TV, I'll bring this back to you, Priscilla. Mm. Do, do you think television is still maintaining 
sexist norms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can you say? Um, there are some programs that try to be more sensitive. Mm. Um, but it's the sum amongst the many, mm. unfortunately. And yeah, I, I don't know how you go about uh, changing an entire industry that relies on gender stereotyping to make profits. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the bottom line, really. Um, it means challenging an entire organizational ethos and orientation towards the world that depends on women being sexualized and objectified in certain ways and men being in control. Mm -hmm. um, this is not to say that South Africa does not try. Mm -hmm. I think South African television does try. Mm -hmm. I mean, there have been quite a few examples in South African media over the last 10 years, say, which really do try to challenge gender norms, um, ideas about sexuality and sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. And and they, they receive flack. I mean, think mm -hmm. of um, Generations and yes. the gay storylines. I mean, they that was, that was not received neutrally. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was not received with open arms. Mm. So, yeah, they, it, it's pushing against the stream. Yeah. You, the, we, we, we can't, it's not just television, is it? Mm. I mean, it's, it's a context, it's a social context. I know? think just mm. using the Generations example, because mm. it's something that I'm fairly familiar with, mm. but we had the incident of Garabo on mm. it, who wanted to have more than one husband, which mm. exactly. challenged the traditional norms yep. of only men being able to do that. Yeah. Then yeah. we recently had Wandile, who now is mm. Wandi, who is um, transitioning, transitioning yeah. right? Yeah. So I think although, as Priscilla said, those issues mm. aren't necessarily welcomed um, mm. by a large, mm. um, a large group in society, mm. but I do think that the issues that are representing the realities yeah. of people that are watching these yeah. shows. So I do think although, and I mean, if you look at the viewership of Generations, it's quite large it's, in South it's Africa. The it's, it's the, the biggest. It's the biggest, right? Yeah. So if we have mm. Generations addressing mm. these key mm. issues, I do think mm. that it is a step in the right direction yeah. Yeah. and that it is reaching viewers that might not have access yeah. to like mm. digital media in terms mm. of on smartphones. Absolutely. So I do think that it is a step in the right direction. Yeah. I, think, I think the public broadcaster actually does try to do its best um, with, with that kind of content. I don't think it's always successful, but I don't think we can blank, you know, make a blanket accusation of them ignoring yes. the gender context in mm. South Africa. I, th I think they do try to make um, very good interventions into mm. the gender inequalities that we face. Yeah. yeah. And in the future, what steps do you think we could take towards you know, just changing the entire narrative? <sighs> For me, it's, I hope I don't sound too philosophical, um, but it, it's about a few things. First of all, if we uh, talk about a gender setting, what is the agenda, the current agenda, the agenda that's going to take us into um, a more progressive South Africa? Who is setting that agenda and what for? What are the, what are the ends of that? Mm -hmm. If we can somehow tap into that and start to change what that looks like, we start to move in the direction that we're speaking about here. Mm -hmm. How we do that, Harry, I have no idea. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for this great, amazing opinions you've given about, you know, the future of women in television, black women, and, and everything that we've discussed here today. The future of TV is a contested topic. The opinions expressed tonight have given us insight on the expectations of the future of television. We'd like to extend our gratitude to our guests and our audience for being here tonight. Do have a good evening, and thank you for tuning in.